Karun is a veterinarian from India who's working with Albert DeVries at the University of Florida. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Karun so he can talk a little bit about the economics of genomics. Thank you, Dr. Dalton, for the introduction. So as he has told, I will be talking about some of the economic benefits of combining genomic testing as well as reproductive technologies like artificial insemination, sex semen, beef semen. So before going into detail, I would like to give you a synopsis of what I am trying to present today. So my talk has three different parts. So in the first part, I would like to discuss some of the key basic genetic concepts. So I think uh, having a clearer understanding of these concepts are very essential for a dairy farmer mm -hmm. to make efficient economic decisions. So in the second part, I try to give an overview of what is genomic testing and how it's be better than the genetic testing and what are the different ways in which we can use this genomic testing on dairy farms. And the third part is what I really deal with dollars. So we have this simulation models, computer simulation models, where we try different what if scenarios and try to predict what will be the economic outcome of using the combination of these technologies. So moving on to the concepts like, like key genetic concepts. The first concept I want to talk is about estimated breeding value. So estimated breeding value is the genetic worth of an animal. So here I have an, some few examples. So if you say that my my animal on farm is worth 2,000 pounds uh, of milk, it means that animal is will produce is expected to produce 2,000 pounds of milk during its lifespan over and above an average animal. And the second concept is predicted transmitting ability. It's very much related to estimated breeding value. So as the word goes, predicted transmitting ability. So that's what an animal will transmit out to its offspring. And it's actually, you know, that only half of the germplasm from an animal is transmitted to this offspring. So predicted transmitting ability is half of estimated breeding value. So we take the same animal and if it's having an estimated breeding value of 2000 pounds, the predicted transmitting ability, which that animal will transmit on to the offspring, which the offspring will exhibit during its lifespan will be 1000 pounds. And the next concept is net merit index. So this is again a trait, just like protein, fat, meal, protein like or uh, any of these reproductive traits. This is uh, another trait. But it's a composite trait of all these 10 traits. It's in the first column. So on the second column, we have different units for these traits. Protein, fat, and milk in net merit trait is measured in pounds per 305 days. Likewise, productive life is measured in months. And we have this reproductive traits like daughter pregnancy rate, which Dr. Hansen talked about. And some of these other composite, uh, other feet and leg traits, which Dr. Pineda talked about, the health traits. And on the third column, we have the standard deviation for each of the trait. So let me just try, take this. 19. So that's the standard deviation for protein. It's, it is a measure of genetic variability that you see in the average Holstein farm. And there is also this economic values. So if uh, the economic value of 3.41 is the economic merit that you gain from increasing the protein by one, one pound in 305 days. And this rate as uh, like all the different rates in this net merit index have different weightages. So protein and fat and meat all together is given a weight of 35 percentage. So 19 and 16, 35 percentage. And the rest of the 65 percentage is made up by this functional trait and the reproductive traits. So there is two reasons why I, I have this, this slide. So I will use this net merit rate in my coming subsequent slides. So this I like this trait because it's a balanced trait. So it has this production traits, it has this health traits, it has this reproductive traits. And the second reason is it gives me real dollar values. So I have an 
and one point I want to talk about is recently two more trades paper consumption rate and cow consumption rate so they, they are reproductive trade they had been added to this net merit index or net merit trade and so that you can see that they are giving more weightage to reproduction so here is a slide which illustrates how this net merit can be calculated so we have all the 10 different trades we have the units and this is the predictive transmitting ability for all the different trades for an uh, above average angle. So, if you multiply this predictor transmitting ability with this economic value, let's just take the protein, 70 to 3.41, you will get something around to $40. So, to calculate this net merit value, you just have to sum multiply some product of the third column and the fourth column. So, you multiply everything, add together and you will get $685. So what is this $685? So $685 is the predicted transmitting ability of this animal for net merit trade. So it means this animal is expected to transmit $685 worth of genetic gain to its offspring which the offspring will exhibit during its lifetime. So that's like 2.8 lactation. I wanted to see the what's the genetic variability in net merit on an average Florida farm. So that's where I work. So what we did is we just plotted the age on the x-axis and the predicted net merit of animals in this farm. You can see this plot, blue dots are papers. We have 539 papers and 1058 cows. So this is an average Florida farm and this is before we had done genomic selection or something. So this is data from 2010. And there is two things that you will see in this slide. You will see this high level of variability. So if you take the heifers, you can see that some of the heifers are high as $550 and some of them are as low as minus $100. Likewise in cows, there is high level of variability. So that's one point. And you can see also <coughs> some trend in in the animals on your farm. So, heifers are generally better than the cows. So, these vetted heifers, like this betterment in net merit is coming from the selection on the male side. Because in every subsequent generation, we will be using better bulls for inseminating. So, the bulls are continuously selected. So, we are prone to make this increase in net merit. So, this is this increase is basically from, coming from the male selection. That's my point. So here's at another farm, same story. You have this kind of variation in heifers. You can, you can see the variation in cows and you can also see the trend. Just to verify difference. So you can see the variation is like variation is very different. In Here it's from minus 550 to minus 100. Here it's kind of like 300 to say minus 50 or so. Now I wanted to see whether this genetics is actually being transmitted onto the phenotypic records. Is it real? So what we did is we just plotted the estimated breeding value of milk on the x-axis and the real milk production, 305 day milk production and you can see as the estimated breeding value or as the genetics of the milk increases, you will see that in phenotype. So you see that in production. So that's for real. And another concept which I wanted to talk about is reliability. So you see that when I was talking about this net merit, I was always using expected word. So you cannot actually calculate the true breeding value of animal for any of these traits with 100% reliability. You are actually predicting the breeding, va breeding value of animal for each of these traits. So each of this prediction is based on the amount of information you have and the, as the amount of information increases, you make a better prediction or you make a better, you can make a better prediction and better decisions. To illustrate that point, we have this slide here. So the takeaway message from this slide is as you increase the reliability, you do a better job in 
ragging your animals. So I'll go into details. So let's say I have thousand heifers on my farm, and I'm now I'm talking about this blue line. So I don't know anything about these heifers, and I want to rank these heifers to get rid of some of the worst animals, or maybe select some of the best animals. So I just say I don't have any information. I am just going to rank these animals based on the skin color. I will just do my ranking and then make 10 slots. The worst 10 percentage, the bottom 10 percentage will be here. The 11 to 20 percentage will be here. Likewise to the right and the best 10 percentage will be here. So if I rank them based on skin color, I am just making a random guess. So there in the bottom 10 percentage, there may be some animals which are like plus 600 and as well also there may be some animals as minus 600 for net merit. So when I take the average of the 10 percentage, first 10 percentage, I will usually get zero. So that's the case in all the 10 different designs. So now let's focus on this red line. So this is the case where we have 20 percent reliability. So usually 20 percent reliability is when you have the sire of the hapers identified. So same thousand hapers. But I know the sire of each of these papers. So I rank them again based on this 20% information I have. And I put the worst 10 percentage here, the top 10 percentage here. Then I take the average. So I comes to around minus 250. So I am actually gaining based on the amount of information I have. So I can I also identify in some of my best animals. In case my reliability increases to 40 percent, that's when you have like sire as well as the dam of the animal is identified. So I do a little bit more better job. So that's the concept. And in case I know 100% reliability. So that's like true breeding value. I know true breeding value. So this will, that will be how this green light looks. Sorry, it's orange. Yeah. The takeaway message is as the amount of reliability increases, you do a better job at ranking the animals. You can better select the best animals as well as the worst animals. So this 100% reliability is kind of a theoretical concept, concept and I don't think that's possible. Just to illustrate the point we have that. And again this, uh, this slide is also for the same concept but just have a lot of numbers. So I will just stick on to this first row and I will use the same example. I have this thousand heifers on my farm and I rank them based on 20% reliability. So 20% reliability is what you get before all of my sire is identified and we also account for 15% misidentification. So this, when the sire is not identified correctly as you were telling earlier 15% misidentification we can't so we account for this 15% misidentification. So then we rank all the thousand animals we selected the worst 10 percentage. So that's what you, we put in the first column, worst 10 percentage. So now let's say I know the true breeding value of this worst 10 percentage of animal. I somehow know that true breeding value. So we can calculate this based on the some mathematical formulas. So I compared between the truly worst 10 percentage and the 10 percentage which identified, which I identified based on estimated breeding value of. 20% reliability. So whatever you see as green is where I made good decisions. If I, if you see orange on this figure, it's kind of a little bit worse decision. And if you see this kind of red, you had made bad decisions. So let's just stick on with the bottom 10 percentage. So I said 100 of my animals are bottom 10 percentage, but when I actually looked at their true breeding value, 26 out of the truly worst animals. I have identified correctly. So I made mistake in 17. So 17 out of them which I have ranked in the bottom 10 percentage should have been in the rank 11 to 20. And 14 out of them which I ranked in the bottom 100 uh, should have been actually in the rank 20 to 30. And also I made mistake in identifying some of my best animal 3 percentage. So again this is the same concept. But only change we made is 60% reliability. This is what you get when you do genomic testing. 
When you do germ testing, your reliability increases. That's 60 percentage. So here we did the same thing, the same thousand elements, bottom 100 here. And when we compare the actually the true reading value, we made correct decision in identifying 55 out of the 100. And 22, we made slightly error, slight error, 11, again slight error. But we didn't miss any of these top animals. These three slides as your reliability or as the amount of information increases, you make better decisions. This is at another concept. So this is the basic genetic progress formula. So the genetic progress in any of these traits is affected by three factors. The first one is genetic variation. So you will get good cows, good, good cows for production or reproduction in your farm as well as you will get those cows. So that's inherent in nature and you, I don't think you can do a lot about that factor. The second factor is selection intensity. So selection intensity is out of this thousand animals I have on farm, what percentage of animals I will select so that this will form the future replacements on the farm. So the lower the amount of animals I select, higher is my selection intensity and greater is the genetic progress I make. We are using our reproductive technologies on this factor. So if we are using sex semen, we don't need all the thousand animals. We only need what? Just 800 animals to produce enough papers to be replacements. So I'm just making up numbers. So this is selection this and the third one is the reliability of the test. So reliability of the test as the reliability or the amount of information increases, the genetic progress increases. So this is where the geno genomic testing is actually happening on this factor. So here we have an illustration for calculating the genetic value of animals. So we are using these three, three factors in here. And the trait which I have used is net merit. So the standard deviation of net merit is $350. And the percentage of animals selected. This is the selection intensity, the second factor which I talked about. So you can select anywhere from one percentage to 100 percentage of animals. So I only have this much. Five, five combinations out of the possible 100. And this is the third factor which I talked talk about, reliability. So it, it increases from 10 to 90 percentage. So just uh, let's just focus on the first column. So let's say we are just interested in selecting 10 percentage out of my thousand animals. So if I use a some method which have a reliability of 10 percentage, each of the animal like out of 10 percentage out 100 of the animals which I selected, each of them will worth will be worth 194 dollars. So as the amount of information increases down the line, you can see the worth of the animals that is that I selected increases from 194 to 583 dollars. So with that I have discussed some of the key genetic concepts. So now I go to the second part, this is the genetic testing. So I want to talk about what is the genetic testing or genomic selection and how, what are the different ways in which you can use this genomic testing on your direct farm. So I try to give a overall picture, a bird's eye view of what this genomic selection is all about. So on, for the whole scene population, there is a reference population where you have both the genotype as well as the phenotype. By genotype, I mean like high density chips, like they will measure each of the markers on the genome of this cow. And these cows will have a lot of production records. They have the milk records or the uh, reproductive records and the people at the genesis at the AAPN or CDCP, I'm talking about the USDA, they make up these prediction equations. So all these X's are kind of markers. So we fill in these markers, not we, I mean they fill in these markers. All the X's it will be about tens of thousands of markers and they will give a genomic breeding value. This is how they calculate this genomic breeding value. So let's say I have like 5,000 each of this cow, 5,000 animals on my farm and I am doing this genomic testing with so it is on Neogen. So they will do this genotyping, they will identify the markers and they will send it to the APL and where they will fix, fill in this marker information in this prediction equation 
and they will calculate the genomic breeding value for any of the traits in that selection. So let I, I just concern net merit. So they will give an uh, estimated breeding value for net merit. So now I get back this information, and I will I will rank this 5,000 animals based on that information. And then from this 5,000 animals, I select the best 3,000, and I use different reproductive technologies on them. That's how this genomic testing works. And here I show the reliability of protein using two different methods, the traditional parent average method and the genomic testing method. So you can see that reliability is about 70% and it was about 40% in case you are using the traditional parent average when, where you had the production records, just the phenotype, phenotypes from the animal as well as its relatives. So you can see there is clear increase in reliability in case you are using genomic testing or genomics. That's they want to compare. It's the same concept but having a little bit more numbers. So this is a slide which from Dr. Ken Weigel of University of Wisconsin what he used in some of his studies. There's a lot of numbers, so I just want to focus on the first, first row. So on the y-axis, you have different groups of calves based on age. So we are just taking the heifer of calves. And on the x-axis, we have different amounts of information. So let's just take the first two numbers. So you just assume that you don't know anything about a heifer calf on your farm. So you are making a random decision whether to select or cull the animal. So, the reliability of that decision will be zero. So, in case you had done a genomic testing on the calf, you know what's the genetic merit of the calf and you increase your reliability from zero to 50%. So, that's basically what is saying in this slide. So, in case you had identified the sire of that calf, your reliability would have been 20%. And if you had done this genomic testing on this calf, reliability increases to 57%. So you can see if you know some additional information on this calf, your reliability increases by 7%. Because you know the sire of the calf, so you have 57% reliability here instead of this 50%. Basically, genomic information plus the phenotypic information. And in case you know the full pay degree, so you know the sire as well as the dam of your calf. You can make a decision based on 34% of information you have. And in case you do the genomic testing, it increases to 57%. So takeaway point is, as the amount of information increases, the reliability increases and you make better decisions. So I just wanted to again verify whether this uh, genomic breeding value actually have an effect on phenotype. So this again is a slide from University of Wisconsin. So what he did, Pat Hoffman, what he did is he calculated the genomic predicted transfer lifting ability of milk for some of the papers on the University of Florida, uh, University of Wisconsin dairy farm, and then he waited. Then he ranked them into four different quartiles. Best one here, second best the red dots, third best the green ones and the worst one, the black. And when these heifers began in lactation, so when they finished their first lactation, he plotted the milk uh, against this genomic PTA for milk. And you found that his best quartile produced, like 83% of his best quartile were above the average milk yield. So the takeaway message from this slide is, as you increase the genomic PTA for any of these traits is going to be translated into phenotype. Uh, so here I have some data from CDCB to just to show what's the prevalence of genomic testing in US till this December 2014. So it basically started in 2010 or something. And you can see this yellow blocks and if you take the December 2013 to December 4, 2014, it's around 250,000 animals which are tested with low density 
genomic test. So you can see that people are definitely interested in this genomic testing. They are seeing the value of genomic testing and they are actually doing this. So now that we know that genomic testing increases the reliability and there is more information. So I want to discuss what are the ways in which we can use this information. So there are at least four different ways in which you can use this information. The first one is to rank all these animals based on the amount of information you have and then cull the waste animals and keep the rest of them. So that's the first way. Then the second way is, okay, you are a little bit more risk taking. You want to try out different recovery technologies like sex semen or maybe if you are a little bit more risk taking and you, are, you, you can invest in in vitro fertilization, embryo transfer, you can do that. So that's a second use. You can breed differently. The top top experts, native animals you identified during the talk. The second use, you can use sex semen, beef semen, embryo transfer, anything. So the third one is parent identification. So on US Holstein farms, or oh sorry, US dairy farms, there is about 15% of animals that are misidentified. I think David Arp is going to talk about that. In detail, so I will not get into that. Then the fourth use is purchasing animals. If you want, if you want to bring in some heifers into your herd, you can actually go on different farms or wherever it's available. And if there's a group of hundred, you only want your demand is only twenty. You can actually demand the what is the genetic breeding value of any of the trait you are interested in. So you can, so it will help you in purchasing animals in case you are purchasing. So now that we have discussed the different uses of genomic testing, I have some profitability estimate based on some of the analysis we have done. Before going into that the analysis, the first thing you, when you are going to do this genomic testing is the investment you make in this genomic testing. We have to spend money to do this genomic testing. So what we have, we assumed 40 per, 40 dollars per test, and we uh, we assume that only the kept animals benefit from the genomic test. So on the x-axis again, you have the percentage of different percentage of animals you can keep on your farm, 10 to 100 percentage, and the percentage of animals you test. Let I'm just focusing on the first column. So in case I had 1000 animals on my farm, I kept 10%, so I kept 100 animals. Yeah, I only test 10% of the animals, so 10% is 100, 100 in due price is, so that's around 4000, 4, and when you divide by 100% of animals kept, that's again 10%, so 4000 divided by 100, that comes to 40. So you probably can do this calculation by yourself. So this is the calculation we have done to calculate the cost of testing. And naturally when you invest in testing, a question arises, should I test all the 100 per state or should I just test 10 per state or should I test 50 per state? So we we were interested in question in this question and we calculate, we use the same approach. We had this thousand animals and we rank them into different 12.5 percentages, different groups of 12.5 percentage. So that's what you see from 0 to 13, 88 to 100 percentage. And in case you didn't do any testing, so let's say we assumed we had this parent average and we rank them. So this is the average of our top 12 percentage. And the decision to test all the animals or test percentage of animals depends on your strategy. In case you just want to cull the bottom of bottom of bottom X percentage of the animals, so we said that we we had a strategy where we just tested the bottom percentage of animals. So the bottom percentage of animals had higher reliability. So we could calculate the average of the bottom 12 percentage very very close to a scenario where we had tested all the animals. So if our strategy was to just cull the bottom animals, so my suggestion would be just 
test the bottom first state of animals. And in case you wanted to keep the, you want to breed differently the top X first state of animals. So that's what we did with this, this violet color. So that's this one. So you can see the average of the top 12.5 percent animals is very close to the average of the strategy we are used you know, testing on all animals. So in case you just want to breed differently the top X percentage of animals, maybe testing top 50 percentage is the good strategy. Or in case you want to do both culling and um, breeding differently the top X percentage, maybe you should test all your animals because the cost of testing will be somehow accounted for when you combine these two strategies. So this is again the same concept from Dr. Weigel. So you, again you, we have a lot of numbers so I only want you to focus on this part of this slide. So on the y-axis you have the different percentage of animals that is selected top 10 percentage to top 90 percentage and on the X axis the amount of information in case let's say we know the full pedigree of animal. So and we just want to keep the top X percentage of animals. So whatever you see as bold underline means after accounting for the testing cost these animals which you keep are going to give you returns in the current generation itself. So bold underline you get the you get the return in the current generation itself. If it's just underlined, it may take future generations to return to get the return on investment. We are just testing and just culling the bottom or something. Here he has not uh, taken into account the income that you get from doing repertory technologies. So you can see that if you just want to keep the top 10, 20 or 30 percentage of animals, Maybe your best strategy is to genomically test the top 50 percent of animals. So you can see this bold underlying values. So in case you just want to cull your animals, maybe you're better off testing your bottom 50 percent of animals. That's what you see <coughs> this bold underlying animals. So now I will move on to the some of the calculations Dr. Devries and some of them which I have done. So we have this kind of diary models, diary simulation models, it's just like having a diary on a computer. So having this models is the advantage of this is we can test a lot of what if scenarios which you probably cannot be, we can probably you cannot do using some of the physical experiments because it will take a lot of time to calculate this kind of things. So it's a alternative way of doing things. So we have this models. The model had we have we had this papers, cows just like so whenever I talk about model just picturize that's mm -hmm. just like a herd. Just like a herd. So we had this papers, cows. So we we had this lactation curves for this cows based on some of the more mathematical models. So there are model uh, mathematical calculations where you can calculate how the lactation will progress in first lactation, second lactation, third lactation. Then we accounted for the feed intakes. So based on this field production, we know the what will be the feed intake. And uh, we had this different risk of culling for pregnant animals, for open animals. So the <coughs> risk of culling will be different for death, for death culling will be different, life culling will be different. So we took these probabilities from one of Dr. Pinedo's study, which he did with Dr. Ibris. So then we account for different probabilities of consumption for each of these parities and different prices. We also had this genetics incorporated. So the genetic trait which we consider was netmeric because we wanted to see what is the change due to genetics in actual dollar amounts. Then we accounted for this age trend. I showed you that the papers will be better than cows. We accounted for this age trend. Then we accounted for the variation in the parity. Within the parity itself, we will have a lot of variation. <coughs> so the value of the heifer calves that came out of this model was a function of net merit of the dam. It was based on the dam's net merit. Then the other calves like beef calves or 
the bull calves, dairy bull calves had fixed prices based on some of the market values. And this was the response variable. We are actually in, interested in profit per milking cow per year. So one additional thing that we accounted in the model, uh, what uh, the King data based on the study says. So what they say is, if you have a female fetus, your milk production is going to increase in that lactation as well as there is a carryover effect into second lactation. So, so this is kind of a new study. So we kind of bump the milk production curves in case it's a female female fetus and added a value of about thirty dollars extra in case it's a female fetus. So if we are if we are if when we're, whenever we were using this sex semen, we know that when sex semen is used. When compared to conventional semen, the consumption rate is a little lower in case of sex semen. And also, when sex semen is used, you have to pay an additional premium for the sex semen. So it costs more. It costs more than conventional semen. So this assumption had to do with some of our profit calculation. So this is a snapshot of what our output from the model looks like. You can see the milk sale is about. Uh, per milking cow per, uh, per year it was 4600 so cull sales was about 400 and other, this is the dairy calf value per milking cow per year so these are the this these are the additional revenues we got and this is the cost you can see the feed cost is about 41 percentage of the milk sales so that's typically what you see on farm so or any of our calculations from here has to do with this inputs and the outputs so and we, you can see that the profit was $686. So this is our base scenario. So we, whatever heifers, extra heifers we had, we rank based on 0% reliability. So just skin color or something. So if you do that, if you are doing no genomic testing, with all those inputs, this is kind of the profit you will make. Expected. And how do we validate this kind of models? How do we know that what we are doing for on this computer is actually real or not? So that's one question typically people will ask. So we basically validate our model based on a lot of herd statistics. So we we'll look at what is the pregnancy rate, 21 day pregnancy rate that my herd had. What is the pounds of milk my cow produced? What is my annual culling rate? What's the feed conversion? And all the distributions of cows in different parities. So we, based on these output statistics, we just validate our model. So now we move on to do some of our what if scenarios. We will use sex semen or beef semen in coming slides. So in this scenario, this is our base scenario. The we only use the conventional semen. And we observe the change in profit. So whatever dollar value you see, 24, 49 is 686 plus 24 so this 40 so that is what 710 dollars <coughs> this one is 710 dollars so this is 686 we just made it as a base 686 so on the x axis you have different reliabilities so 0% that's just like random random selection 20% this is random sorry fire identified 60% <coughs> that is when you do genomic testing and when you are gone for the genome testing. So under our base scenario, we were able to get 12% surplus cows. We have 12% surplus cows and we rank all these surplus cows, all the papers based on 0% reliability and we just sell the 12% paper cow. So we didn't make any additional profit because we made a mistake in identifying our worst surplus cow. Some of the cows which we sold was actually best cows on our farm. So in case we knew the reliability to be 20 percentage, we knew all the sire of this heifer cows on the farm. We uh, we did a little bit more better job in identifying our worst 12 percent calf. So whatever 24 dollars extra that you see here is from selling the worst heifer cows as well as due to the genetic merit of the calves 
genetic merit of the 88 percent of the cows we identified. So in case we did genomic testing and we only had 12 percentage surplus calf after accounting for the cost we didn't make much progress much profit but then in case we use sex semen on all the kept cases we use two times sex semen on all the cases so if you use sex semen you produce more cases so that's what you see 22 percent surplus cases so if it's 22 percent surplus cases you uh, if you rank all the animals all the heifers or uh, with zero percent reliability you have this worst 22 percent so based on uh, based on this extra 10 percent of the surplus heifers this 34 dollars comes from selling those extra 10 percent heifers this is actually the meat value and in case we rank them based on 20 percent 20 we made 83 dollars over that 686 dollars so that comes from the cull value as well as from the genetic merit. And in case we did genomic testing and after accounting for this cost, it was about $111. So, uh, two reasonable scenarios we see on farm is if you don't use genomic testing, this is what you make if you use two, two times sex semen. And in case you do genomic testing, you gain like $30. So, this is for whatever inputs that we assume. And now if we move, if we are a little bit more aggressive, if we want to breed differently the top X percent of the animals. So we did the same thing, two times sex semen, but then those sex semen were used in the heifers, which are top 50 percent. So, and sex semen was again used in top 50 percent of the cow. Not all the heifers get the sex semen, only the best heifers. So maybe they are, they have a slighter more genetic merit for this kind of reproduction or something. We get for this for only the top 50%. In, in this case also we got about 23% surplus calf. And in case we ran all the them based on zero percentage, we made this $30 and $30 extra was basically from the cull value from the calf. And in case we do rank based on 20% reliability, this is 83 and in case we did the genomic testing like 115 so that's basically same as the previous scenario but still you made profit if you do this genomic testing so now we have this scenario where we tried additional to the sex semen we also used beef semen on the bottom papers in case we use this beef semen on the bottom bottom heifers, this, this is where you don't do genomic testing and you, this is where you do genomic testing. You didn't make profit. But the takeaway message from this slide should not be that, oh, beef semen is not profitable. No, it's not right. So we, the loss we had here was related to the inputs we put in. We had accounted that our dairy female calves are 300. So the premium bull calf, which we got from this beef semen was worth Seventy-five dollars than the three three hundred, so that's two twenty-five. And some of the diary bulls that came from using the conventional semen were worth one fifty. The profit which comes from this scenario has to do a do a lot with the volatility of the prices. In case your premium bull calves, I'm talking about the crossbred bulls, are priced more than the diary calves, this scenario may be profitable. This all holds good only if you have good fertility. Earlier I did show that our model had 22% fertility. So in case I only have 15% fertility, I don't produce any excess paper calf. So there is no use in genomic testing since even if I do this ranking, I cannot do anything with this paper calf. I don't have enough paper calf to do this different reproductive technologies. So fertility is very important. That's the takeaway point. So we have this model and we developed this based on some of the relevant factors based on our knowledge of this dairy management. And we chose uh, inputs which we thought were reasonable. In case you want to do it on your farm, so you can use this as a benchmark. But then as Dr. Hansen or Dr. Pinedo told, there is high variability in farm to farm. So there is some of the 
maybe I'll, I'll get uh, examples of her performance. So we had assumed that our herd produced like 22 pounds, 22,000 pounds. Your herd may not produce that much. Your expected price may be different. Some of the prices which we assume may not be the price which you get in different parts of the United States. And different risk preferences in case you don't want to use sex semen or beef semen. So that will vary. So your best strategy will differ. So you have to come up with the best strategy which suits you. Which suits you. So maybe you can consult some of the extension personnel near you or maybe you can be consultant so that it's tailored to your needs. Currently I will summarize with this. We have this, whatever we work on this grant is, we try to study, we have a slightly more complicated but more accurate model. We, we try to incorporate the in vitro fertilization embryo transfer into that model and the, uh, the calculations from some of the soybeans people show that you can have like top 5% of animals as donors and you can produce these embryos from them and maybe you can use less than 95% rest of the less than 95% of animals as recipients on a farm. So there's a lot of weak links in the system. So if you go on to produce this embryo in, in lab, there's a lot of weakness in the system. Maybe if you talk to Dr. Hansen, he can enumerate like 100 different possible, <laughs> possible weaknesses with the system. But we, we will make progress. That's what I feel. So I, we just want to calculate what are the genetic value when we do this in vitro fertilization, what's the economic value. So with this computer simulation model, solely investment you need is some of your time and some of your imagination. So we think that's a good way to do this. So if you don't need all the, if you use the top 5% of animals to produce enough embryos on farm and if you don't need all the 95% of animals as recipients, you can actually use different options. Maybe you can use sex semen, beef semen as we had used and we are after some of the optimal scenarios which can maximize your profit. What percentage should be sex, should use sex semen, what percentage should use beef semen and what percentage should use embryo in their uterus. So again we are interested in the profitability of better fertility. So I know that they are, uh, Dr. Hansen, Dr. Pinello are interested in improving the fertility from 28 percentage to 32 percentage as we showed in slides. So we want to calculate the profitability if the fertility increases. In summary, as we have seen genomics increases the reliability and you have a lot of information coming in with this genomics. Before you use that on your farm, just as the people say, just think before you leave, just make your own decisions. Like, am I interested in doing in vitro fertilization of sex semen or I just want to cull the animals? So whichever way you go, you can use genomics and if you make correct decisions, it can be profitable. With that, I end my talk. Thank you.